when we go to a concert nowadays, we hear music from lots of different times and places. We might hear, I don't know what, we might hear Mozart, we might hear Vivaldi, we might hear Bartok, we might hear Beethoven, all in the same concert. And because of that, there would be fewer people in the Mozart Orchestra, and then later in the concert, as you, you know how it happens, a bunch of people come on stage to play, uh, to play the bigger pieces. That's what we're used to. What Beethoven's concert goers were used to was all music from now. And the more now it was, the better they liked it. So the orchestra stayed pretty much the same size. In a concert in Beethoven's day, you, would, you might have heard a symphony, a concert aria, uh, Mr. Beethoven improvising at the piano, a piece of chamber music, a piece of church music. You would have heard all the different kinds of music there are, but all from now. We hear all one kind of music that is music for orchestra, but from all different times and places. So our listening experience is quite different from that of the people who went to Beethoven's symphony. This is, I claim, one complete piece of music. Um, and it may be the first time that that kind of unity in a piece that long has been achieved by a composer anywhere. And that's one of the reasons that makes the Ninth Symphony worth talking about for so long. And it's one of the reasons that makes it worth listening to and that gives us that sense of this is an important piece. We don't always know how to give words to that sense. But when we have that sense that this is something important, we are very often right. And if we've spent a lot of time here thinking about little details, it's all not to pull apart a biological specimen so that it dies, but to watch very carefully some living thing and to try to see by looking at as many details as we can how the whole large thing is. It's remarkable how long you can talk about something that takes such little time to happen. And it's because, I think, when we're listening to music, we're doing so many things at one time, as I've said. So that's one of the things, I think, that makes this a timeless piece. I wonder what it's like to listen to that symphony in 1824 as compared to what it's like to listen to that symphony today. What were they doing that we can't do? And what can we do that they can't? We have talked about a number of aspects of that that have come up in our conversation. But we probably have to remember that the, first, that the first performance of the Ninth Symphony was, by our standards, not a good performance, depending on what we mean by good performance. By good performance, we probably mean something about the precision in the performance how well all the violins played together, how well the winds played in tune, whether anything fell apart, whether all the entries came in at exactly the same moment. We now have very high standards for things of that kind, and we pay close attention to it. And we know the symphony very well, so we expect that and nothing less. The performance itself was under-rehearsed, the music was too difficult for some of the performers. By the time they got to the symphony, the singers were tired and left out some of their high notes. Probably the violins didn't all go up and down together because they all had different training and this was an orchestra that had never played together before this concert. Some of them had played together, but all of them never. Why did people put up with that? This was actually the norm for putting on concerts of this kind. This was not a bad concert, it was a normal concert for big pieces with orchestra and chorus and solo voices. Beethoven's other concerts, Mozart's concerts, all the kinds of concerts of the Tonkünstler Societe, the concerts of the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde, were things that were put together for a particular event, rehearsed, with as much time as was available, but never as much as we would feel we need. And they put on the concert, and people keep going to these concerts that by our standards might not have been well rehearsed. So they thought it was okay. What was okay about it? Why, why is that kind of music making possible? Well, for one thing, 
it must have been necessary for a musician to be a really good sight reader. You, uh, and we know from experience today that it is possible for musicians to be expert sight readers. People who play music for television jingles and things like that, who studio musicians, you get a job, you show up, you have to play the viola track of a 30 second commercial, they give you the music, they put you in a room, they close the door, you have a click track that says start, you play that music. If you miss a note or do anything wrong, you never get a job again. It's true. And there are people who make their living doing exactly the right thing at first sight. It's perfectly possible. And it may be that that was one of the important skills that musicians had in 1824. It might be that with two rehearsals you could come up with a, an acceptable performance of most music. This was not most music. So, but that's one of the things that must have been important. Another thing is that we listen to music and we say, that's too fast. Or, you know what I mean. We say, oh, Antal Dorothy never did it like that. We have our idea of how the music goes that's based on our experience of that same music, maybe many times, or maybe just many times listening to our record of Arturo Toscanini conducting the Ninth Symphony, which is my situation. So the Turkish march in this recording I just played you was way too slow. Whatever might be meant by too slow. Slower than I'm accustomed to. But what we're doing when we do that is not listen to the music, we're listening to the performance. If you see what I mean. We think about, and, and if you look at CDs, very often the picture of Leonard Bernstein will be a lot bigger than the picture of Beethoven. Is that not true? And because we use, in some sense, the Ninth Symphony as a platform, as material for people to make some sort of personal expression with. We say, Bernstein's Ninth, Ozawa's Ninth. Well, it's not Bernstein's Ninth, it's Beethoven's Ninth. But part of our listening has to do with that backlog that we can't make go away. But for people in 1824, I think, the performance was, the quality of the performance was important, and those critics who wrote about it did say it was a pity not to be, that the performers weren't able to give it with all of those nuances of light and shade that such music deserves. But what they were listening to, I think, was the piece itself. They were listening, you might almost say, through the performance to the music. And we use the music in order to listen to individual performances. So it's a very different kind of listening, it seems to me. And our, uh, our, the people like us, but who lived in 1824 in Vienna, probably listened to music in a very different way from the way we do.